Hi everybody, TJ Mac Vintage Cards and Nostalgia here. As you know, I'm not one that speaks about long-term investing in the hobby, but I actually find it funny that there is so much content on it. If I was in it solely for the money, it's really not that hard to figure out the vintage cards that have a good chance to grow in value. I don't need daily videos, fancy diagrams, and thumbnails to show me that legends such as Mantle, Aaron, Clemente, Jackie Robinson, and Mays in the best condition you can afford them is a fairly safe way to go. If they're declining in value, then chances are the hobby is suffering along with them. I don't need to be shown an online auction catalog to know that rare vintage cards of Cobb, Walter Johnson, Gehrig, and Ruth are good investments that have the best chance to hold their value versus my 1989 Dan Marino, 1983 top Steve Garvey, and 1979 Chuck Foreman. I lived the growth of the hobby as an adult collector over the past 25 years. I was buying PSA 6 1960 maze cards for $30 to $50 a piece, and late 60s mantles in the same grade for about $130. It's not because I was some genius. I was involved in the, in the hobby at a good time, and those were some of the players I acquired to help build my collection because I wanted a connection to the past. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, I was reading an online article from the United Kingdom this week about why there hasn't been a Christmas song that's been a huge hit in years. Now think about it for a minute. What other time of year do you hear Perry Como, Bing Crosby, and Nat King Cole on man mainstream radio? Now, Paul Carr, professor in popular music analysis at the University of South Wales, says that many of us, regardless of our generation, listen to Christmas music that tends to be from the 1970s and before. Now, I know this to be true because I see it in my household, with my own kids who are 11 to 18, and sure there are some modern Christmas songs that creep into their rotation, but most of the music we enjoy is the classics. Now the reason is, is because nostalgia is such a powerful force in our culture, particularly around Christmas time. Christmas pop songs are just loaded with nostalgia. Think about White Christmas, which is the biggest selling song of all time. The lyrics are about nostalgia and hearkening to Christmases in the past. There's a timeless quality that connects generations. Now, the article finishes by stating, ultimately, there's no reason why an original track can't become a Christmas classic in the future. All it needs to do is find itself getting played every year, and that takes time. A Christmas song needs years in order for it to percolate, and enter the festive canon. The point I want to emphasize with vintage collecting is that like a Christmas song, others' nostalgia can become your nostalgia. I don't think necessarily collecting only Cobb, Ruth, Mantle, Jackie Robinson is a way of capturing nostalgia in your collection. Of course it can be, but those players are also historical figures. They're icons and they're legends of their game, that could be bigger than nostalgia. What I mean about someone else's nostalgia becoming my nostalgia is, for example, these three Enos Slaughter cards. Now, my father was born in 1948 and would tell me all about Enos Country Slaughter and how he vowed to always hustle on the diamond after he was called out by a coach in the minors for walking to the dugout from the infield in between innings. After that, Slaughter gained a reputation for always hustling, and this was on full display in Game 7 of the 1946 World Series between the Red Sox and the Cardinals. With the game tied 3-3 in the bottom of the eighth, the Cardinals' Enos Slaughter singled. The next two batters were out. Now you have Cardinals outfielder Harry the Hat Walker at the plate. He had a ball to left center field, and Enos, in what became known as the Mad Dash, darts off from first base, ignores the sign to hold at third, and scores what becomes the game-winning run. This game took place two years before my dad was born, but he learned of it from my grandfather, who was a big baseball fan, and he in turn passed the story to me when I was a kid. Nostalgia is inherited. I added this 1952 Bowman Enos Slaughter on the Cardinals to go along with the other two I have in my collection. And when I see this card, I'm taken back to that moment. 
the power of nostalgia. I also don't buy the thought process that because you didn't collect something as a child, that you won't collect something as an adult because there's no collection or connection. Now, I never owned one vintage magazine before my family received my father-in-law's collection. Now I want to add more because I've captured the nostalgia that it gave him. I smell the old paper, read the articles, admire the artwork, and just like White Christmas blaring on the airwaves, I'm taken back to the past. Not my past, but his past. This magazine with Indians hurler, Mike Garcia, references the Indians' big four. It wasn't a big three, it was a big four. And here you can see on the inside the four-man rotation that my father-in-law came of age to. It got him through his teenage years right up to near the time of his marriage. Now because of him and his gift to these magazines, his nostalgia has become my nostalgia. Up until five years ago, I never bought one football card before 1957. And even then, it was the guys who were stars in the 60s like Johnny Unitas, Bart Starr, and Jim Brown. Those were the players that were frequently glorified by John Facenda in NFL films when I was growing up. It wasn't until I had a deep conversation with my father-in-law and his love of listening to the Browns as a kid on the radio in the late 40s and early 50s that I became enamored with this era of football. Now when I add a card like this one here, this 1952 or 51 Bowman of Max Speedy that I picked up a few weeks ago, it makes me think of him sitting on the floor, listening intently to them on a cool, crisp fall Sunday. His nostalgia becomes my nostalgia. So I'm optimistic for the future of our hobby. I have no idea if cards will remain financially valuable in the long term, and I don't think anybody else does. Sure, it'll be nice, but I'm certainly not building my collection that way. I have a stock portfolio, pension, and other investments that will hopefully help my children someday. Rather, I want to give them the gift of nostalgia through these cards. I want to pass on part of me through this 1983 top Steve Garvey. It will likely not grow much value-wise in the future, but my kids will know what he meant to me as the face of the National League when I was growing up. Or this 1989 Dan Marino. Yes, there are likely well over a million of them out there, but this one is mine. I paid probably 50 times what it would be worth without this plastic case and grate on it, but it's how I chose to collect and capture my nostalgia. I want my kids to know someday that Marino had the quickest release I ever saw, and at one time he obliterated single season and career passing records. Then you have this 1987 Donruss Roger Clemens. Yes, it's worth very little, but it reminds me of going to the corner store and buying a pack after pack of these cards, hoping to pull the stars of the day. It's something they will never experience because cards aren't sold that way anymore. But I want my nostalgia to be their nostalgia as they envision me riding my bicycle to be quick, grabbing a Coke and a bag of Doritos and a few packs of Donruss cards. Now during this Christmas season, my boys will be getting cards to help them build their collections. It'll be different than how I collected, and that's okay. It doesn't have to be like the old days. The world changes, but what's important is my channel's here to help them remember how it was like in the past, which will make them appreciate the hobby more as they grow older. For my daughters, they will realize what this hobby means to me. It's not about the big score, having the biggest names, or building a cardboard portfolio similar to a NASDAQ index fund, but rather it's a reflection of the ghosts of their past and the heroes they looked up to. So, Chuck Foreman, while you may not be able to pay for my kids' college loans someday, you'll have a place in my collection because you're a reminder of the first cards I likely ever opened, giving me memories that are priceless. Everybody have a great weekend, and we'll talk again soon.